Welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your Shovel Goblin host, Daniel Green, and today, of course, we're going to be jumping right on into the Wheel of Time update. Because we have had it confirmed that the Wheel of Time will be returning to Prime for Season 2, September 1st. Along with this news, we got a whole lot of looks at Season 2 with some images that show a lot of the promise of season one and some of the problems. Starting with some of the positive, this approach to the Sean Chan costume is wildly different than I imagined it, yet I still really like the stylistic choice that's being done here. It's good to see Donald Flynn as Matt, though it's a very sad shot for a happy character and not what I would hope to be my first look, but I am really excited to see how this actor stepped up to the challenge of reimagining a character fans have already gotten and largely enjoyed. Most of the cast still looks good in their roles. I don't know what lens they've put on Yosha Stradowski here to have his jaw look like it should be registered as a weapon, but good God. Slipping into some of the negative though, never a fan of back scabbards, even if they're mentioned in books, and the costuming still has this very clean and even the framing itself just like overly crisp look. One thing I find myself wanting to see in hopefully season two, definitely at least season three, and wanting to see done really well is some in the white tower classroom learning the one power scenes. People constantly ask me about my hindsight thoughts on season one. I'm tempted to do another review of it just to satisfy those people at this point. But something that I think season one, most people agree on failed to bring enough of to the screen is great representation of Robert Jordan's arguably greatest fantasy magic system ever, channeling the pattern, you know, Saedin Sayadar. And there was some of it and a couple neat moments with it in season one, but how it was communicated, the clarity of the rules Robert Jordan really stressed, that was absent. And I would love to see, you know, White Tower classroom scenes or even just more smaller moments between people learning and those that are experienced channelers really getting into the nuances of Robert Jordan's creation. And if you listen really closely right now, you can hear people typing that I am being too harsh and not harsh enough. Wow. <laughs> and I'm really excited to say that we are getting a release from SF Tibbs. That's right, well known for popping up in my Twitch chat and also posting his <laughs> novel to my fantasy news channel asking if it's okay for indie authors to do self-promotion, SF Tibbs is going to be releasing a book, and this is amazing. To answer your question, yeah, if you're an indie author, go ahead and plug it in fantasy news. I'd be happy to promote it. With the back reading, the Franklin family could not have imagined what awaited in the aging mansion they inherited. And SF Tibbs, for a first time publication, that's a really great cover and a good pitch. You should be very proud of this. And for fans of The Broken Binding, or just Illborn in general, you are getting a new hardback printing that looks damn good. Broken Binding has continued to impress, and I'm sorry I actually missed the news that they're doing a new Malazan run. I missed it, and then by the time I caught it, I had just put out a news and I was like, Damn. But yes, of course, go ahead and check out Broken Binding, not only for Illborn, but also their upcoming Malazan project. I have been hunting for a complete Malazan set to help occupy the shelves behind me in one glorious series, and Broken Binding doing it? Dream scenario. I will absolutely be signing up for that. And for both my Pratchett and Neil Gaiman fans, we have had it announced that Good Omens is getting a graphic novel adaptation that is currently being funded on Kickstarter and about to pass my Kickstarter and backers. Tinyurl.com slash Neon Coast. This is being adapted by Bram Stoker Award winner Colleen Duran and I really hope we keep getting more Pratchett content and Gaiman content in the future. They are both very special storytellers. And in a story I somehow forgot to cover in the first recording, we are also getting the release of Wicked Problems by Max Gladstone, one of the co-authors of This Is How You Lose the Time War. Gods and lawyers battle for the soul of the world in this action-packed second volume of Max Gladstone's Craft Wars, an epic fantasy see like no other wicked problems will be available April 9th of 2024. I'm covering this not only because Max Gladstone apparently has an awesome beard I now get to show you, but also because this allows me to recommend This Is How You Lose the Time War once again. Now if you're in the mood to just swallow on down a whole bunch of more book covers and pass judgment like a god, the next round of SPFBO contenders are having their covers voted on by the public for a winner, so I went ahead 
ahead and cast my vote, and you should do so as well, because you can affect real change in the world on who has the best cover. I may have spent some money on Twitch. Because we were live when I came across the still in stock as of recording this folio release for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy full series for a whopping $875. Or 600 pounds if you're a tea sucker. That was weird, I love you British people. Please don't think that was serious. And I at first told myself, nay, I won't be spending nearly $1,000 on these books. God, I'm I'm actually sitting here like I can do no I can't. I cannot do $875. How expensive would be too expensive? No. They're $875. How excited are you about these? I'm just saying, like, it's also a business expense and a tax write-off. Alright, yeah, I'm okay with it. Yeah! I may have already started ordering them because you just started seeming positive. Summer is just around the corner, and Wraithmark Creative is ready to kick off your reading list with a massive sale on the widely popular The Wraithblade Saga by S.M. Boyce. Boyce, known for her epic settings, powerful heroes, magic, and action, has crafted a story that is sure to captivate readers from the first page. Throughout the series, you'll follow the assassin Connor as he delves into an action-packed, fantastical world filled with knights, dragons, and an undead abomination. With an almost full five-star rating and nearly 5,000 reviews on book one alone, The Wraithblade Saga is a story you won't want to miss. And as for that sale, as part of the launch of the third book, Wraithstorm, Wraithmarked Creative will be offering the first two books, Wraithblade and Wraithforged, for only 99 cents in the US and the UK both. This offer will only be available for a limited time, though, so click the links in the description down below to get your hands on the Wraithblade saga today. And in who could have seen it possibly coming news, the demo for the Gollum game has officially been released, and now it is the worst reviewed game of 2023. <laughs> Now, this is according to review aggregate sites like Metacritic, so it's not exactly what I'd call a scientific process, but even non-scientific processes you can take some things away from. And as we have watched here on Fantasy News over the last year and some change, the development of this game has been, I would say, borderline tragic. And I went and watched several people doing demo playthroughs, and I did not find a single streamer or chat audience that seemed to be even remotely positive on the play experience of this game so far. I have hope because of how much they're fucking up major IPs. I really have faith that the average consumer is actually going to get educated on not just buying shit based off, off IP. And it's not because I think the average consumer is that smart. I think it's because they're fucking up that bad. So it's the next day and I've managed to spend a little bit of time with this game and I am sad to say that it means I need to come back and be even more harsh because not only does this look absolutely disgusting as a game visually, but the gameplay elements are lacking just as much and are just as unpolished. I feel so bad for the people who actually had to work on this game and who have put out quality work for this indie publisher before being so clearly mismanaged managed by whoever decided to bite off more than could possibly be chewed at this company by agreeing to handle this massive IP with, it seems, some form of restriction that prevented them from doing any concept that would actually be more engaging than a golem walkabout, which is the experience of this game at its core with no interesting flair on top, aside from trying to enjoy visuals that end up looking like garbage. I'm not interested in playing this game for another minute, but I am genuinely interested in like a behind the scenes documentary about who made what decision along the way and what deals were struck that this is what ended up being made. I hope the actual game developers over at this company get to work on something they clearly have passion for in the future and are freed from the soulless IP cash grabs that dominate the entertainment industry now. But what I hope receives the complete opposite reaction upon its release, we have also gotten the official 
special trailer for Talos Principle 2, which yes, we got a flood of PlayStation related trailers uh, over the last week due to the event that happened. But this one caught my eye in particular because the first Talos Principle is a game that I am planning to start playing on Twitch next. And it just really nailed the trailer. I just think this one of all the trailers I saw, everything released was the most impressive. And it's like bumped the first Talos Principle to the top of my to be played right Im immediately. That, that happened it, right when the woman in the trailer went Faith. And every now and then in fantasy news, I like to take something that just seems to be fun and goofy and put it in front of your plate. And that today, this week, is going to be Delicious in Dungeon, which is exactly as it sounds, an anime adaptation of a manga where the premise is around adventurers cooking and making delicious meals, it seems, out of the monsters and strange things they encounter within dungeons. And if that isn't a fabulous original idea to do with the typical call to adventure story, I don't know what is or could be left because I love the hell out of that. <laughs> what does a mimic taste like? An owl bear, is it more chicken-like or bear-like? You remember a while ago on Fantasy News, we covered the fact that a Project Hail Mary adaptation was in the works with Ryan Gosling loosely attached, and I'm happy to say that that seems to have not disappeared into the ether of abandoned Hollywood projects, but now we actually have co-directors Lord and Miller attached. Lord and Miller's have very interesting resumes from being involved in the writing of Into the Spider-Verse, and of course, heavily involved with the Lego movie. And both of their overall resumes don't make me think they're not qualified to go in and helm a Project Hail Mary uh, project. I actually would like to see them have a lot of control over this, but their resumes specifically make me think their vision, their interpretation of a Project Hail Mary will probably be a bit different, but very interesting. And with Project Hail Mary being such a spiritual successor to The Martian, I would like to see an adaptation that would feel a lot different than the adaptation we already got of The Martian and Lord and Miller are absolutely qualified to bring that to the table. So I'm pretty pumped for this and Ryan Gosling isn't again who I would have chosen immediately, but is certainly someone who could do an interesting take on the main character of Project Hail Mary. So this is one of those adaptations that's kind of floating in the, I wonder how that's going to solidify space. And and we have also had it announced the absurdly overpriced and arguably unfinished Star Wars Disney Hotel is shutting down. It turns out people don't want to pay insane prices to stay in rooms without windows. Genuinely though, I do feel really bad for anyone who was excited to stay here one day or saving for it. People who poured their hearts into trying to realize a vision of what could have been a really cool experience, but it just seems so mismanaged and mishandled handle and execution that I feel like anyone paying attention could have seen this coming a mile away. If you have bookings in this hotel, apparently they're going to be reaching out to you to modify your plans. I've only recently discovered the vast sea of theme park related content here on YouTube. And to say it's become an odd passion of mine to deep dive into places that I have absolutely no desire to go to at all as a massive germaphobe and like crowdphobe. Why is the human brain the way that it is? But this this has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Like and subscribe if you have not already and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. And of course, check out tinyurl.com slash neon ghost if you'd like to follow the Kickstarter before it goes live. Thank you all so much. And thank you all for being so supportive during this time of my life. Have a great one, y'all. Peace.